Hi, I'm Debbie Gliori and I'm a writer and an artist, illustrator and today I am a filmmaker which is something I'm not very good at as you will see. Um, I'm making a film because I can't come and visit you in your library and tell you all about my books because of this pesky, pesky virus which really is getting most annoying. You know, we had spring and we had the virus. We had summer and there was the virus and now we're in autumn and we're still wearing masks and having to stay at home and protect each other. And it means we can't do a lot of the things that we used to be able to do. And for me, as a writer and an illustrator, it means I can't go into schools and libraries and talk to you. So the only way I can talk to you is by making a film. And um, I'm not very good at that. I can make books, I can draw pictures, and my children do tell me I can cook a mean pizza, but films, oh my goodness. This is quite difficult. Anyway, bear with me. What we're going to do is we're going to take a walk. You know, some people go to work in the morning and they walk or they take the bus or they get in a car and drive or are driven. But I am lucky enough to work from home. Well, not exactly home. It is home. It's one minute from my house in the garden. But this is where I work. This is my shed. Great big grey shed. Doesn't really look like much. Shall we have a look in the window and see what we can see? Quite difficult with all the reflections. You can probably see me reflect. No, you can't see a thing. All you can see are reflections. Or oh, you can see some books. There's some books out the window. Some more books. What's around the side? Oh, this looks very strange, doesn't it? If you looked in, would you know that in this strange looking grey shed was someone who made picture books. Do you think you'd guess? Or do you just think it was somebody who really could do with tidying up her studio? Because my goodness me, it is completely crammed with stuff. Anyway, come this way. Come inside. This is one of the best bits about not being able to travel and go and meet you all in libraries and schools because it means I could bring you here. Come in. This is the door to my international shed quarters. This is where I've made 80 picture books over the years. Not all at once, but over many, many years. That's what I've done. So this is where I work. This is my very, very, very crammed studio with just oh, so many things in it. People come in here and they start crying because they think, how could she possibly find anything in this complete pit of a room? But I know where everything is. Well, just about where everything is in here. But you have to admit, there is rather a lot of stuff. Most of it books, which is hardly surprising because books are what I do. Anyway, do come in. I'm going to show you some things and then I'm going to tell you a story and I'm going to show you how I came up with the story. I'm going to show you the sort of rough drawings. But let me tell you what, what everything, well not what everything is, because that would probably take all your lives. You'd be about 75 years old by the time I'd finally said the final thing and said, oh, and this brush is for You'd be a very, very old person indeed. What I'm going to do is tell you what a couple of things are, just to give you an idea of what it's like working as a writer and an illustrator and a painter and an occasional fiddle player and a mum and a few of the other things that I do. So, starting off... Let's start here. What have we got here? We've got notebooks. Can you see? Lots and lots of piles of notebooks. And notebooks are where I come up with ideas for books. 
most of my notebooks are sort of sketchbooks and most people most artists draw things in their sketchbooks i tend to I've got a terrible habit of just writing things in my sketchbooks which makes them very boring to look at well not all of them are very boring some of them have got pictures in them but most of them i've just got lots and lots of writing oh i quite like this one this was for a story idea but it was a bit a bit bleak a little girl who's little brother was um, a gingerbread man and she loved him she loved him so much she hugged him and his head fell off well that was never going to be a particularly good story for children I thought it was wonderful but nobody else did this was a story about a little girl whose little sister was an elephant and you can see that the elephant is about to ruin the little girl's painting what else have we got this is somebody finding something wonderful in their computer that doesn't happen very often. This is a story about a little girl whose little brother was a dragon. You can see about mm, not so great having a dragon as a little little brother because he set things on fire. So you can see this is where I sort of work out ideas. I mean, as if elephants would brush their teeth. Do elephants even have teeth? But inside the pages of a notebook, that's where I can come up with the ideas that eventually become picture books. At least that's the sort of general idea. So I sort of play around. I quite like this. I don't know if you can see. Can you see this is this is what it feels like. I was trying to draw what it feels like to be happy. And sometimes you're so happy, it's almost like your feet leave the ground. There we go. And before you know it, you're flying. How wonderful is that? Anyway, so piles and piles of notebooks so I'll start off an idea in the notebooks and then if it actually sort of seems like it works and it has what I call legs I will turn it I will write it and I will write it in a notebook in my sort of scribbly writing which looks a bit like that and then if I still like it I'll eventually type it out on my computer and I'll tell the story over and over again. This is, you can just see version four. Can you see that? And it's about a little girl called Wilma. First line was, Wilma was last but one in a family of fearsome Viking warriors. So that is the beginning of a story. And I'm having such fun with this story. It's a story about a little girl called Wilma who was last but one in a family of fearsome Viking warriors. Now these drawings are where I am trying to work out what Wilma looks like because you know I write that Wilma was last but one but I've got to work out exactly what she looks like. Here she is reading the Viking recipe book about how to make soup and I don't know but that actually looks like it's a book about poo doesn't it? Because written in Viking writing is poo but that's meant to be recipes for stink fish. Maybe it's Maybe it says that because it's so smelly. Anyway, I play around over and over with drawing the people in my stories so that I can get them right, so that they look like I want them to look. So there's Wilma with her little brother, Harold. She has to look after Harold all the time. And it's not much fun being the babysitter all the time. You get very bored being the babysitter all the time. She also gets very bored. Viking girls had such a tough time. She gets very bored having to cook the stink fish in the soup. You can see, look, her face is like, oh, poo, smells horrible. And the worst job that Wilma has to do is this, which is mending the underpants. Can you imagine? How bad would that be? Anyway, enough of Wilma. Wow, I'm so looking forward to working on Wilma. Once I get the drawings of her to the point where I really like them, then I'll start working out what each page in the picture book about Wilma and Harold is going to look like. And I just do little scribbly drawings at first. I'm trying to show here what Wilma would look like. She's very small, so all of the Viking armour looks enormous on her. Her sword is colossal. Her shield dwarfs her. Her helmet drowns her but she looks she looks brave she looks really brave and once I get the drawings 
sorted out to my own satisfaction and I think it was beginning to look like a book then I get to start to paint and that's the bit of making a picture book that I just oh I love doing the painting bit the painting bit is marvelous and I paint I paint with these oops sorry this is going to be very spinny sorry there we go that's my paint box it's kind of messy isn't it and if there aren't enough colors in there I'll also use some of the colours in there. And if that's not enough colours, I will add other colours in pencils and all sorts of things just to get exactly the colour that I want. And when I paint, I paint with brushes and I've what I hope is a very steady hand, sometimes with really, really big brushes, absolutely enormous brushes. Um, I'll put that there because it's trying to roll away. These are big as well. Look how big that is next to my hand. That's for doing big sploshy washes. And this enormous brush, that's for putting in backgrounds and skies and sort of seascapes and hills if you want to put it in quickly. This one is a bit like that too. And then there's this strange looking brush here, which is very, very thin. I'm just looking a bit bent. This one is absolutely brilliant for drawing grass. You just flick it across the page and you get these gorgeous lines with it. And then if I want to do tiny little details, you know, people's faces, their noses, their smiles, I do them with that little brush. I've got lots of brushes. Loads and loads, you can see some of them there. Some are huge and some are small. So that's the sort of technical bit of what I do. Um, the fun bit though, of course, is the bit when we get to read stories. So the stories start off here. This is This is where I write them. I don't actually like writing on a computer. I far prefer writing by hand in a special notebook. I like I like these very, very fancy notebooks. Don't judge me, but they're just so great. Really, really good. And they're very, very thin paper. And as you can see, I write on both sides and I write in ink. There's something about using a fountain pen to write your stories that is just fab. It seems to make me think properly. So I'll sit here and writing, you know, don't let anyone tell you that writing should be easy because it isn't. It's very hard. I will stare at the walls. I will stare out the window. Not that window. I'll try that window. No, not that window. I'll usually end up staring out of this window and thinking, what am I going to put down next? That's the difficult bit. Sometimes it's very easy, sometimes it's very difficult. An awful lot of my job involves staring out of the window and wondering what to write about. But today, today I'm going to read you a story that I wrote a long time ago that I'm very fond of. And it's called The Snow Lambs. And I'm going to tell you where the ideas came from. And then I'm going to read the story, but not out of the book. Well, I will read the actual words out of the book, but the pictures. Um, I'm going to show you the original paintings that I did for it. This is the snow lambs. All right. Thank you. So this is the cover. The picture for the cover, and you can see there's a little boy and his dog. And that's the front and the back cover together all in one picture. I'll show you because when you actually take the book and do that, there we go, that's the whole picture there. Right, when you open a book the next thing that you see are the end papers and I always think the end papers are a bit like, it's like when the curtain goes up in a theatre and none of the players are on the stage yet but you just get an idea of what's going to happen. Ooh, I wonder where this So this is almost like a map of where all the action in the book takes place. 
and you can see that everything has got a name. All of these places. Wolf Snoot, what a fabulous name. Papana Water, I do love that. And all of these are on a sort of bit of, it's like tracing paper, called an overlay. So when I lift it up, you can actually see the picture much more clearly. And you can see there's a tree quite near the house. A kind of dead looking tree. I keep your eye on that tree because that is quite an important part of the plot. Okay. Oh, noisy paper. So the next bit is what's called the title page, which is where you put the name of the book, The Snow Lambs, and the name of the author and illustrator, Debbie Leori. And in case I haven't introduced myself, that's me. Okay. And that was a really easy picture to paint because it's just a great big expanse of blue and white painted with that great big thick brush that I showed you earlier on. There we go. Okay. So let's begin the story. Thank you. Okie doke. So it starts off little boy and his dad. It was just before tea time when the snow started falling. Sam, his dad and Bess the sheepdog were counting in the sheep from the river field. Looks pretty wintry doesn't it in that picture. And imagine if you've got a huge flock of sheep it must be quite hard to keep track of them. Now that sort of white box in the picture is where in the book the story goes, where the text goes. And it says, I think you counted that sheep twice, Dad, said Sam. Dad was looking up at the sky where storm clouds gathered. The branches on the old elm creaked and Sam shivered. He looked around. I wonder where Bess is. He thought, if the wind gets up, that old elm could blow down across the power lines and we'd be in trouble, said Dad. Can you see where Bess is in that really wintry picture? And Bess is quite well camouflaged against all the darkness. Can you see where she is? Yeah, that's right. You spotted her. She's, oh Lord, oh dearie me, where is she? I've lost her. She's oh, there. This is so weird having to do it backwards. There we go. There's Bess under the old elm. Now at this point, this was quite fun. I'd never done this before in a book, but what I did was I split the book into two stories. And I've divided the stories. So we find out about Sam and his dad. And we find out about Bess. So there we go. The wind felt full of sharp little teeth, nibbling at Sam's nose and biting his ears. Come on, Sam, let's get these sheep in, said Dad. I can't see Bess anywhere, said Sam. Where is she? When the sheep were safe inside, Dad yelled, Bess! Bess! Come here! His voice was lost in the wind. Come on, Sam. Let's get you inside. You look half frozen, he said. Now, all that time, I wonder where Bess was. And look, there she is. Oops, can you see? Dad is, what's Dad doing? Dad's locking the door. They took off their boots and coats in the porch. Dad bolted the door behind them. But how will Bess get in? Asked Sam. She won't, said Dad. That dog is useless. Maybe being shut out will teach her a lesson. And you can see brave Bess. There she is. 
which is there with the sheep, but it doesn't say that in the story. You get to tell the story of what happens to Bess and the sheep. After supper, oops, after supper, it was bath time as Sam jumped into his bath with a huge splash. He thought, Bess will need a good hot bath when she gets in. Oh, and look at Bess. Is she having a good hot bath? Oh, poor Bess. That looks miserable. Imagine how cold that muddy puddle is in the snow. Oh, I don't know if you've ever broken through a snowdrift into the muddy slush underneath, but it certainly is nothing like a hot bath. Yeah, oops, missed the cat. There we go. Mum wrapped Sam up in the cocoon of a warm towel and then dried his hair. That's quite a storm brewing out there, said Mum. Will Bess be blown away? asked Sam. Don't worry, Sam. Bess can look after herself. And look at Bess. In the moon, in the full moon, she looks like she's having her hair blow dried, except it's not being blow dried by a nice warm hair dryer, it's being blow dried by a, a nice freezing cold gale. And there's the sheep climbing up, gamely behind her. You can imagine Bess saying to the sheep, come on, I know what I'm doing, follow me. I know how to look after myself. And I don't know if you've noticed, but Bess's story is getting bigger and bigger. And Sam's story in the picture is getting smaller and smaller. I hope Bess doesn't have to dig her way home, thought Sam, digging out his pyjamas. I love the expression on the sheep's face. The sheep is just so sort of admiring of Bess, going, wow, you're really good at digging. I'm so glad I'm with you. You know what you're doing. And there is Sam digging as well, digging out his pyjamas. I think I'd rather dig out pyjamas than I would rather dig out snow. And you know how there's points in a snowstorm where it just gets crazy and there's so much snow you can hardly see. It becomes what's known as a whiteout. Sam wriggled into his pyjamas. Help! he thought. I can't see a thing! Outside, snow filled the sky with blinding white flakes. Oh, I hope Bess can see to find her way home, thought Sam. It's getting dark. Oh, my goodness. Sam asked Dad to read him a monster story and then wished he hadn't. It was a very scary story. Let me see. There we go. Outside, the wind howled. I hope Bess isn't scared too, whispered Sam. Bess looks as if she's terrified. Maybe it's just all the eyes in the dark. Poor Bess. The wind grew louder, hurling itself at the house as if it wanted to tear the roof off. Bed's the safest place on a night like this, said Dad. No, said Sam. 
Come on, Sam, upstairs, said Mum. I'm not going, cried Sam. I've got to wake up, wait up for Bess. I like Sam. I like the fact he's loyal to his dog. But then there's a terrific crack of lightning across the sky. <gasps> oh my goodness me. And there's no story at this point, no words in this picture. And I thought actually that the, the sheep and the dog were too scary. So I painted it again one more time. And there they are. Oh, oh my goodness. Imagine that. It would be so scary in the darkness for a great big flash of lightning to happen because you would not be expecting it. And sometimes lightning strikes things, houses and trees, and it sometimes hits the ground. And look what happened here. It's all right, Sam, said Mum. It's only a power cut. I knew it, said Dad. That old elm has brought down the power lines. Oh, poor Bess, said Sam. How will she find our house when there are no lights? Never mind her. You'd better find your way to bed, said Dad. But look what's happened. Can you see? That flash of lightning has brought down the old elm straight across the river and Bess and the sheep can get across. That is amazing. That great big white blob above Bess is actually where I had to take away lots of paint so that we could put the story on and so that you could actually read the story over the paint. I'll show you what I mean. In the book, it looks like that, so that you could actually see where the story is. It's very important to be able to read the book as well as enjoy the pictures. Now this is one of these, I like drawing these kind of pictures, where you, where you divide the story up into panels. So you sort of start with the one where Sam is in bed here. Sam couldn't sleep. He kept thinking about Bess. He could hear something outside over the howl of the wind. But it sounded like a sheep bleating. Sam tiptoed downstairs and unbolted the door. At first, he could see nothing through the whirling snowflakes. You know how when you open a door in a blizzard, or there's a blizzard outside, and it blows into the house? That's what's happened in that last picture there. This one. Is it this one? Or that one? Where are we? This one. <laughs> Here we go. I wonder what is outside. Do you think you know? I bet you do know. Have a good guess. You're absolutely right. Something large and wet blundered past him, followed by Bess. Bess! Ah, oh, you're covering me in mud, Bess, laughed Sam. And then he looked round and thought, uh-oh. And he rushed upstairs to get mum and dad. Why do you think he's thinking, uh-oh? What do you think the something large and wet that blundered past him was? Do you know? Yes, you're absolutely right. Can you imagine? Not only your wet doll comes home, but also it brings with it that sheep. Oh, my goodness me. 
Well, Bess, it looks like you're a better shepherd than I am, said Dad. What a clever dog to bring my best you home to lamb. Sam wrapped his arms tightly round Bess and whispered in her ear. Brave Bess, what a clever dog you were all along. I'm so glad you're home. And look at Bess's face. She knows she's the cleverest dog in Scotland. She just looks so pleased with herself. And she sort of, look what I brought home. Yes, what a good dog. And the last bit of the story. And later, when the wind had dropped from a howl to a whisper, the kitchen filled with newborn bleating. They're snow lambs, said Sam. It was the perfect place to be born. There we are. The very, very last picture in the book is another map, but it's different from the first map in the book because of course the snow has fallen and as you know snow changes the land completely it covers it in a blanket of white and again all the place names are on there but I wonder if you can notice the difference from the first one something has changed And it's down at the bottom, across the river. Can you see? Oops. Lord, it's quite hard to do this. There we go. You can just about see the old elm across the river. And there's Sam and Bess waving at you. Before I did the pictures in the real book, I actually made what's called a dummy book, which is a really strange name. It sounds like it's a stupid book, but it's not a stupid book. It's the sort of first version. I'd never done that before. I'd never actually made, made a sort of pretend book, which is what this is. And you can see it's got a completely different cover to the first one. What's the real one? I like this cover because I really love that picture of um, the sheep looking very admiringly at Bess digging her way out. And I just wanted to sort of show you some of the bits. It's got the maps and it's got the title page and it's got them counting the sheep in from the river field. It's also got my favourite picture of all, which is that one. And it's Sam and his dad getting the sheep safely into the shed. And it really, really looks like a very, very snowy landscape. There we go. And I painted my way all the way through that book. They are rough paintings, as you can see, but it was just so that I could check that it was working. There's Sam and his bath. There's Sam having his hair dried. And nobody ever sort of sees these rough books or these or, or the original rough drawings. Um, I had Sam originally under the bed digging his pyjamas out, but we changed that pic. Well, I changed that picture because the publishers didn't like it. There we go. That's them in the snowstorm with Sam staggering around with his PJs. So it is more or less, more or less the same. But it's really helpful for a writer or an artist to actually plan out the book before they settle down to do the finished pictures, because it's quite hard to change the finished pictures. You can see this one's different, because look, the sheep 
it looks like 25 sheep are running past in the background and I quite oops, I quite like that idea but again the publishers thought no that is too confusing and it is pretty confusing I imagine you're thinking what on earth is that long sort of concertina type thing that's like a gigantic caterpillar yeah probably better that I didn't actually keep that bit in um, I think the ending Oh no, it's different. The ending is slightly different. You can see the footprints across the rug and she's already delivered her lamb in front of the Rayburn in that picture. But they decided, the publishers quite rightly thought we would keep that for the very, very last picture in the book. And there we go. And there is Bess jumping up on Dad going, you! were so mean to me I'm going to put my muddy paws all over your clean PJs which I think is fair enough. So who do you think is the hero of that book? Is it the sheep? Is it the lambs? I'm pretty sure it's not dad. Is it Sam? Or yes. Is it Bess? I think it is. Anyway Hope you enjoyed that. And now, librarians, small people, large people, in between size people of West Dumbartonshire. Um, my favourite bit actually is the questions. And I love getting questions, especially when I'm there with you and you're firing questions at me and we're kind of, you know, bouncing off each other. It's, you know, it really is good. However, uh, because I'm not in your library, except digitally. Um, I've been sent some questions beforehand, um, a list of them, and they're really good questions. So I'm going to do my best to answer them. Um, so here we go. The first question is from Hannah, and she says, do you test your books out to see if they like them and to see if you need to make any changes before you send to your publisher? If yes, who do you test your books on? Well, it's a really good question, Hannah. When my children, I have five children, and when they were little, um, I used to, with no compunction whatsoever, test everything I did out on them. And sometimes I do it really sneakily. I am a bad lady, honestly. I wrote this novel many, many years ago, back in 1999. And it was one of six. This is the first book in a six book series, but I didn't know that. I'd never written a novel before. And um, when I wrote it, I thought oh, it was meant to be for a sort of nine to 11 year olds. And I just happened to have two of those in my house, both boys. And at the time, people were worried that boys weren't reading enough. So I tested it out on them. But I didn't say to them, guess what? Mum's written a book because they would have gone, Oh, really? That's very uninteresting because actually I think most children want their parents to be like wallpaper there and, you know, helpful and nice, but background, not doing anything exciting, like writing books. So what I did was I told them somebody else wrote it and that they'd sent it to me to find out, you know, to sort of test drive it, as it were, with my children. So I did that. And the boys, bless them manfully read the books about the book two copies one each um from beginning to end and I said so what do you think trying not to let on I was like ah please like it um and they both went yeah it was really cool really liked it and I went oh great guess what I wrote it and they went oh so that didn't go too well many many years before that I wrote uh, one of my first books this one a line at bedtime and I wrote it for my youngest son Ben when he was very little because he was absolutely terrified of lions we'd taken him to Edinburgh Zoo he'd seen the lion in, in its enclosure and he just had nightmares ever since so I thought well, I mean, what a twit I am I thought what a great idea I'll write my book about what happens when a lion comes into your bedroom at night I mean for heaven's sake his worst nightmare in a book there it is, his worst nightmare. And unsurprisingly, when I tested this out on him, before I even did any pictures, the first line in the book, there we go, first picture, can you see? 
The first line in the book was, Ben was a brave little boy. Fearless, said his father. Courageous, said his mother. Pushy, said the cows. And Ben burst into tears. I'm not fearless. No, fearless. No, don't read it. Don't want to hear it. So that was not a success. But these days, my children are very, very big. Some of them are actually over 40. So they're not really around to have my books tested out in them. So I test out my books on my long-suffering partner, Michael, who has listened patiently to every single book I have written, including the really, really long ones like this. And bless him, he occasionally says, I don't think you should say that, or I don't really think that works. But most of the time he says, great, write some more. So that's exactly what you want to hear as a writer. Great, write some more. Oh, I shall have it tattooed across my forehead. Anyway, next question is from Julie. How did you become a good writer? She asks. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Julie. Um, I never consider myself a good writer. I consider myself a writer who is learning and my craft of writing because I think the minute you start thinking you're a really good writer, then you probably start losing the plot. But th there are no shortcuts. I think to become a good writer, you need to read and read and read and read. Just read tons of books because every book you read kind of goes into a sort of internal sort of cache of stories and they're all there inside your head and if you combine all of these stories that you've read with the life that you're living that's what makes all of those stories yours and at some point what happens is they are all the stories are jumbled up together along with your life and then I think they start leaking out in the form well they certainly did with me in the form of stories of my own so there are no shortcuts. The best way to become a good writer is to write. So I write and I score out and I occasionally do doodles on the pages. And this is one of many, many picture book notebooks that I have. And you can see I, sc I score things out because that's what writers do. They write and they correct and they write and they correct. And it takes a long time. Here's a one of my notebooks for one of the sort of later on novels um, from a series called Witch Baby. And you can see, I mean, there's just tons of scoring out. Things that just never made the final cut. And you just write. And you try at first, when this is a first draft, you can tell because it's such a complete dog's breakfast. And when you're doing the first draft, what you're basically doing is the story, it's the story coming out of your head for the first time onto paper. And you just mustn't think, you mustn't think about it. You mustn't have that voice in your head that says, this is rubbish. You can't write for toffee. You've always been a rubbish writer. You just have to ignore that and plow on. And yes, the first, the first attempt at a story usually is quite rubbishy, but once you've got something down on paper, then you can start tweaking it and editing it and cutting bits out and adding new bits in. So that's my that's my best advice. So um, the next question is from Leila or Leila. I think it's Leila. And have I written any books about a dragon? Oh, well, my goodness me. What a good question. Have I ever? I, I'm fascinated by dragons. So starting right back at the beginning, this was the second book in that series I told you about. They've got amazing covers, um, thanks to my publisher. They're sort of soft and furry. Um, a, a fellow writer once said you could use the book to put your makeup on, you know, sort of rub them around your face, but no, I'm not going to do that. But anyway, as you can see from the cover, there is a dragon in this book and in the other book and in the other four books in the six book series and it was by writing about a dragon that I began to almost get under its skin except dragons don't have skin they have scales so thinking like a dragon I really enjoyed it I absolutely loved it maybe I have a you know a sort of secret dragon inside me so I went on and I wrote picture books about dragons so here we go 
there's this one which is even called The Trouble with Dragons. And this one is quite popular in schools because it is all about climate warming and climate change. And there are some very amazing look at well, I love my dragons. There's a dragon parent with its little one in bed. And um, yeah, this book is absolutely full of dragons. There's loads of them. My favourite picture is that one. In the book, there's lots of dragons and a sort of drowned world. There they are. So that's the trouble with dragons. And then there's Dragon Loves Penguin. And that's all about a dragon who wants to have a baby of her own, an egg of her own, but she can't. And then she finds one. And look what's inside. It's not a baby dragon. It is something completely different. And then our, there's this one, which is for older children. And this is about my very own personal dragon. And I have a sort of occasional tendency to feel quite sad and quite miserable. And sometimes I sort of personalise that by turning how I feel in my imagination into a dragon. So there is a dragon roasting me. Can you see that little figure? There we go. Who's standing in the flame. So that's another dragon book. And finally... This is a bit of a spoiler alert. If you want to look away and not find out what I'm going to say, because it kind of gives away the ending of the book. This book, The Bookworm, has a dragon in it as well. In fact, you can see from the cover, there's a dragon on the cover of a book. And it starts with a dear little worm that has its very own life underground. I'll just about see. Until a little boy comes along and takes it home and has it as a pet, puts it in a fish bowl, and then watches it grow. There it is. And it grows, I think mainly because, well, it's probably going to always grow, but also because he reads its stories. And he just happens to read its stories about dragons. And, you know, sometimes you become what you read. So, um, oh, last one is from Flora. Hi, last question. And Flora asks, what is my favourite word? That's a really hard question. I have a lot of words that I love. But if I had to choose, if I had to choose one, I think it's the one that sort of kind of opens up my my imagination like a flower. And every time I hear it, I think, Ooh, oh, that sounds so good. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, well, I don't know what you're thinking. Maybe you're thinking cake. Maybe you're thinking buns. Maybe you're thinking chocolate. Um, but actually, it's none of those. It's a word that describes a colour. And here is the colour in a paint tube. And the word is ultramarine. And it's all one word. So you say ultramarine, ultramarine. And it just sounds like supermarine. And marine makes me think of the sea. So it's kind of like super sea maybe ish that's what it sort of starts off in my mind but it also happens to be my all-time most favorite color you can't really see or maybe you can can you see it's a very very dense blue where's the camera in this thing there we go maybe you can see that Ooh, here we go yeah it's quite a deep blue and i'm very very fond of the word but i'm also very very fond of the colour and I've put it in every picture book just about that I've done. It's all over the cover of that. Various shades of it. Some of them very pale, some of them mixed with black. It's all over this book as well. Good night baby bat. It's very very blue that book. I'm very fond of this book. This is the only book in the world that has a snowstorm in it. Check this out. Look, baby bat, now even the world is being tucked in, flake by flake. Oh, wrong page. <gasps> Can I ever get used to this? Flake by flake, softly, softly, under a quilt of snow. And see all the snowflakes? Anyway, I digress. Last book of all. This one, all the way home. So much ultramarine in that book.
It's very, very blue, but it is actually, it is a Christmas book and it has a guest appearance from Santa Claus. But that, as they say, is another story. Thank you for your question. Bye.